Hi, I'm Kat, and today I'm going to show you five Final Cut Pro tricks to restore your Super 8 footage. So what is Super 8 footage? Super 8 millimeter film was released in 1965, and the film is actually 8 millimeters wide. You'll see that the rectangular perforations along the side are smaller than in previous film formats, and this allowed for a greater exposed area. Filming with Super 8 cameras can add a vintage quality to your project, but it can also be super challenging. I'm gonna go through what some of these challenges are in the editing room and how we can enhance our picture to get the best possible look. So my family uncovered this long forgotten box of Super 8 rolls in my grandparents' basement, and I learned that my grandpa used to carry around one of these Super 8 cameras in the 70s. It wasn't very popular to have these back then. Uh, they were expensive, it was kind of hard to use, and it wasn't like it is now where we need to film every second of our lives. One amazing moment he caught on camera was Evil Knievel doing an epic jump at the Minnesota Dragways. And to this date, this is the only recorded footage that's ever been released. So I was pretty psyched to find it, but it also needed some major restoration. So I've done a lot of work on this and released the full restored version on YouTube, and I hope you'll check it out. And we're going to be using some of this Evil Knievel footage in our tutorial today. So you can see where we're headed with this restoration video. I've lined the clips up before and after we've applied these effects. Side note, this is Evil Knievel's epic entrance onto the Minnesota dragways with a security detail in tow. First off, we can see the camera footage is quite shaky. This is because Super 8 footage is shot at 18 frames per second, so handheld camera shots tend to look quite a bit more jumpy than today's standard 24 frames per second. The jumpy quality is especially apparent when the camera zooms in or out like it does in this clip. Next you'll see that my grandpa stopped filming for a while, then decided to film again, so the footage jumps to the next scene of Evil standing with his helmet on. Here I'll click to add a new project, and let's take a look at the settings. Film footage is typically a 4x3 or 16x9 aspect ratio, and Super 8 film footage is a 4x3 aspect ratio. When I received footage from Legacy Box, the company that digitized the Super 8 rolls, the dimensions of the MP4 film clips were 640x480, so I'm setting this as the dimensions for my new project. If you want to check the dimensions for your digitized footage to be sure, Right-click on your clip and select Get Info from the drop-down menu. Now that we've set the dimensions for the project, let's pull in a short clip of the raw Super 8 footage and let's play it back. Stabilization in order to stabilize the footage, I'll need to cut each clip so we can stabilize each scene individually. I'll scrub to where the clip changes and hit Command-B to cut the clip. Now I'll check the Stabilization box in the Effects panel to see what Final Cut deems to be the best stabilization parameters for the clip. That's what the Automatic option in this drop-down box means. Final Cut is selecting between Inertia Cam and Smooth Cam to get the most stabilized clip. Here we see the automatic choice was to stabilize with Smooth Cam at 1.5 translation, rotation, and scale. This means we're sacrificing a bit of the picture around the edges in order to gain the best possible stabilization. I think this is a very smooth shot considering the footage we're working with. But for this particular shot composition, I'd like to keep as much of the audience in the frame as possible to highlight the big crowd that was attending Evil Knievel's big jump. So I'm switching to Inertia Cam, which by the way is a great go-to choice for footage that includes zooming and a lot of movement. Once I switch, you'll see I already gained back some of the frame. I think the clip looks very stable, but now we'll play with lowering the amount of smoothing to see where the sweet spot is. To my eyes, keeping the smoothing at 1 is the smoothest clip I can get for how much cropping I'm willing to accept. Color Correction First let's try using Final Cut's Automatic White Balancing Tool. We're going to click on the magic wand here and select Balancing Tool. Wow, the colors are already much brighter and more vibrant. 
I love where we're headed here and I'll say this auto balancing tool doesn't always work, but it's almost always worth testing out as it can save you a lot of time. Now let's go into our color correction tool here and click on exposure. I like to click view and select video scopes so I can have a visual representation of how much room I have to work with the exposure levels. A good rule is to never let the shadows dip below zero and never let the highlights reach above 100 or the clip may lose some of the details in the highlights and shadows. So let's see what looks good here. I'll bring the shadows down here and I'll play through the whole clip to make sure we never dip below zero on our video scope. Now let's do the same with our highlights. You can see here if I bring the highlights beyond 100, we lose a good deal of the data in the highlights. I think this looks good with a 25% boost on the highlights. And we'll see there's a bit more contrast to our clip. Now let's go into our saturation tab and let's boost the overall saturation. I'm really liking this clip at about a 65% saturation. If I boost it all the way, the color becomes so saturated it almost looks cartoonish, and we're really trying to restore our footage here as realistically as possible, so let's hold back a bit. I noticed some of the skin tones in the grass looks a bit dull, so now I'll boost the midtones to, let's see, about Fifty percent. You'll need to play with each clip to get the levels that look right to you. Keep watching back the clip as you keep making changes to make sure everything looks good throughout. Now we can get a bit more detailed here. Let's add a tiny color adjustment to subtly tint the clip. This Evil Knievel event was on a very hot summer day, and yet the clip has a cool tone here. Let's add just a hair of red into the shot to signal a bit of the sun's glare at this time of the day. I'm just adding 2% of a red tone to the master. Noise control. You can see here there's quite a bit of noise in the clip we want to eliminate. Let's pull the noise reduction effect onto our clip. Noise reduction can be found in the basics tab of your effects. Now the default setting is removing a lot of the noise, but each clip may require you to play with the levels to get optimal results. Here, since there's so much busy foreground and a lot of detail in the overall shot, I'm seeing a medium amount of noise reduction paired with a very low sharpness is giving me the most appealing results. Sharpen. Sharpening a very blurry shot like the clip we have here can be tricky, and it's very easy to overdo it. Here, I'll drop the sharpen effect on my clip. You can find the sharpen tool in the blur tab of the effects. And yes, we've already played around with the sharpness factor in the noise reduction effect, but this additional sharpen tool allows you to make much smaller incremental changes. Here I found sharpening to the level of 5 gives just a bit more clarity to the footage without distorting the image. You're probably very aware of those signature Super 8 black specks and spots that flicker across the screen. It's quite difficult to eradicate them completely, but I found a trick that's easy to use when you have a simple background like the sky. Let's check this out. Masking. Here in this clip you can see there is a piece of debris in the upper right hand corner. Let's mask it out. First, duplicate your clip and place the new clip directly under your original clip. Now let's find the frame with the debris. Here it is, I can see it's actually in two frames. Grab a draw mask effect and pull it on your top clip. Now that we've created a mask shape, click invert to invert the mask. Add a Gaussian blur to the bottom clip. This is found in your blur tab of the effects. Now the debris has effectively been blurred out, but you don't want this mask to be on your whole clip, you just need it for these two frames. 
So let's only turn the mask on for those particular frames that we need it for. Go to the frame before the debris and pull your fill opacity down to zero and click add keyframe. Now move to the next frame and bring your fill opacity to 100. Let's do the same for the second frame that includes the debris. Now move to the clip after the debris and move your fill opacity back to zero. Let's talk about that keyframe button because when I first started learning about editing, this drove me nuts. The first time you click add keyframe in a clip, every frame before it will then have all the parameters you selected employed. So if I want the clip to have all the default settings up until a certain point, go to the frame before the frame you want to make the changes to and click add keyframe to all the parameters you're about to manipulate. Now everything in your clip before this frame will remain unaffected by the changes you key going forward. Now move to the frame you'd like to make changes to and you'll see the add keyframe button automatically turns yellow for any parameter you adjust in that frame. This signals that the keyframes are saved. Since the keyframe button is lit yellow, if you click on it now, it will unselect the add keyframe, resetting your work in this frame back to the default setting. When you move to the next frame and you want all the parameters to remain the exact same as the previous frame, click Add Keyframe to all the parameters you've previously been keying. If you can still see the spec, you could always increase the Gaussian blur on the clip below. You may need to play around to ensure that the underlying clip with the blur blends well with your top clip. Masking should be the final step after you've made all your other clip adjustments. If you're working with a clip and another clip layered underneath, you need the exposure and color levels to be the exact same, otherwise your mask is going to stick out, it's not going to blend very well. Now let's look at the opening clip before and after. We've learned some great film restoration basics, and now let's test this out with a different clip. Here's Evil Knievel's tour bus arriving at the venue. You can see the camera zooms in and the footage is wildly shaky and the exposure changes quite a bit as the camera zooms. We've also got quite a bit of noise. I'm going to move a bit faster through this clip restoration as we've already gone over the basics. Stabilization. Final Cut selected Smooth Cam as the automatic setting here. But let's just check out what Inertia Cam would look like. You can see that it starts out smooth, but becomes distorted at the end and has a little bit of a jagged playback. So I think we're best sticking with the smooth cam option. Here I'll try the setting out at 1. Here I've opted to scale the stabilization back to a 0.5 as I don't want to zoom too far in at the end of the shot and cut off the Evil Knievel logo or crop out too many of the fans in the foreground. We're sacrificing a little bit of instability in favor of the shot composition, but the overall shot is now much smoother. Next I'm using the Auto Balance White tool like we used before and adjusting the exposure by utilizing the Video Scopes tool. I'm boosting the overall saturation and midtones. Then going to the color board to take a little bit of the yellow out of the master here. Let's inject more bright red into the shadows as the tour bus looks too dark. A 
and let's insert a little blue into the highlights to give the sky a little bit of a blue tint. It's quite a challenge to restore footage that is filmed at a lower resolution and frame rate, and it's good to keep in mind there are limitations as to how much you can restore your footage, and you can't restore something that just isn't there. So if you're frustrated that you're not getting enough detail on a subject's face, it may just be that due to the lighting and due to some of the parameters of the camera settings, you just don't have that data to work with. Don't get down on yourself if you've got a difficult clip. Do the best you can under these limitations. Let's drop the noise reduction tool on the clip. Here we're benefiting most from a high amount of noise reduction as the main focus of the clip is on a large object without very small detail. In the previous clip where Evil Knievel was the primary subject in the clip, he was already very small in the shot so we weren't able to attack the noise reduction as heavily as we can now. Now let's drop the Sharpen tool on the clip. And I'll move the Sharpen amount up. Let's try it at 10. Since again, the focal point of the clip doesn't include a great deal of tiny detail, we can safely sharpen this clip to a higher degree without losing data. Now let's mask out some of those pesky specks in the sky. I won't do them all because that will take quite a while, but we'll just do a few because I'm going to try a little different masking technique here. Here I'm going to duplicate the clip and place the copy below the original clip. Now I'm going to pull a shape mask onto the top clip and we're going to position our mask in the sky to cover over several of the spots. And we're going to pull a Gaussian blur onto the second clip. On our mask, let's invert it. Now we'll keyframe the points and position of the mask so it moves with the clip and eventually moves off the screen once the sky disappears from the clip. We can reposition the size and the angle of our mask. You can also play with the amount of feathering around the mask if you think it's not blending very well from the clip underneath. Here's an obvious piece of debris that didn't get covered by the mask I just made, so let's create a second mask to cover it. And here I think we can boost the Gaussian blur up all the way and it still blends very well with our white sky here. Now let's watch back that clip, before and after. We've majorly restored this clip. If you or a family member have Super 8 film footage stashed away in your attic or garage, I highly recommend you dig it out, go get it digitized, and do your own film restoration. Who knows what amazing historic gems you might uncover. And if you'd like to learn more video editing and DIY hacks, subscribe to The Drunk Bridesmaid. Cheers.